Today, we are ending our sermon series on the shadow of death. And David wrote in Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. And so we've talked a lot about suffering, a lot about pain, uh, a lot about death. But most importantly, we've looked at what the Bible has to say about it. We've talked about how we have a future hope. Yes, death is our enemy but we have something far much greater to enjoy. We're not gonna be floating around in space when we die. Um, we are going to enter a spiritual heavenly domain. We are going to be with all of those who have died before us in Christ, um, who are in the presence of Jesus, and we will be in the presence of Jesus ourselves. And so the grave is not the final answer to our dilemma and our issue when we talk about the problem of evil. We also look to Lazarus. Uh, Lazarus in John chapter 11, he was a man who was close with Jesus. He died. Mary and Martha were suffering greatly because of this death. And Jesus went and raised Lazarus from the dead. But he wasn't distant to their suffering. He sympathized with them. In fact, the shortest verse in scripture says that Jesus wept and meant he was angry at death. He hates death just as much as we do. And then finally, last week, we looked a little bit more about what happens when we die. What are we when we die? And we have found that we are a metaphysical, immaterial, spiritual being that is awaiting a new resurrected body. Today, we're really going to take a look and really tackle this issue on the ultimate question, why does God permit and allow suffering? In other words, why is there this problem called evil? This last week, maybe some of you read it as well, read an article about a recently uncovered gravesite found in Peru where about 227 children between the ages of 4 and 14 were found in a massive sacrificial burial site. Apparently, this ancient civilization that lived there believed that they could sacrifice their children in order to appease the gods so that they could bring a harvest um, or so that they could prevent certain storms. And all of these children were actually facing the sea. And, you know, I couldn't help but ask myself this question. Why would God permit such horrific evil? And certainly there are things that we interact with and see every day, whether it's disease, death in and of itself. And I don't think anybody in this room hasn't really asked this question, why do bad things happen? Why does God permit evil like this? I mean, at certain times when you study, for instance, World War history, doesn't a lot of the suffering seem to be so utterly pointless? I mean, yeah, I can understand certain kinds of suffering proving a point, but why suffering like this? You know, another thing I thought about when I was reading this article about these children who um, were sacrificed to the gods, is I do rest in the biblical truth that these children were saved under the grace of God. Romans 5 is very clear that children die under what's called original grace, not original sin, and God does not hold them responsible for the sin that they commit because they have a certain ignorance about them. They are below the age of accountability. For instance, Paul wrote this in Romans 4.15. He says, where there is no law, there is no violation. In other words, people who are mentally handicapped or children or those who are incapable or unable of fully understanding that I am a sinner in violation of God's law and there is an accountability for my life, God doesn't hold people like that responsible for their sins. That's a biblical truth that I do believe in. I also rest in the justice of God, knowing that God is ultimately good and he is ultimately just and he will never do the wrong thing. But that still doesn't deal with the issue or the problem. Why would God permit suffering like this? Or why would God permit suffering at all? And this isn't a new question. This isn't a new age philosophy. This is something that historians have looked at, that people over the course of their entire life, dating back thousands of years, have dealt with it. There's an ancient uh, philosopher, Epicurus. He put it like this. And speaking of God, is he willing to prevent evil but not able? then God must not be all-powerful. Or is he able to prevent evil but not willing? Then God isn't all-loving. Is he both able and willing to prevent evil? Then why evil? Or finally, is he neither able nor willing to prevent evil? Then why call him God? I think when it comes to the existence of God, the problem of evil is the most powerful. But when you look 
in pure, mere philosophical terms, the problem of evil is no longer used by philosophers of our day and our age because they know it doesn't stand intellectually, but it still hits right here in our heart, especially when we encounter evil ourselves or we read about stories such as this. You know, I think he was ignorant of two things in this statement. First of all, and this is really important, the first thing that he was ignorant of is that he misunderstood God's love. And here's what I mean by that. It is not loving to force someone to choose to be in love with you. In fact, it is argued and could be argued that ultimate love is giving someone the freedom of choice to be in a relationship with you by their own free will choice. And so it, it, it wouldn't be loving of God to force everyone to love him. That's not a loving thing to do. And so Epicurus misunderstood the love of God and that he thought it would be loving for someone to be forced to choose God. But God says, I'm not going to do that because that's not loving. But here's the problem. If someone can freely choose to love you and follow you, what also can they do? They can freely choose to reject you. They can freely choose to do evil. And so while God in his loving nature created free will creatures to freely, freely choose to love him, while at the same time they could freely choose to sin and hurt and harm. There's another thing Epicurus misunderstood, and it was this, God's power. You see, God is all powerful in that he can do anything that is logically possible. In other words, we wouldn't say, well, God can't make a circle square, therefore God isn't all powerful. Well, that's ridiculous, that's nonsense. In classical definition and understanding of what it means for God to be all powerful, they never thought that God could create a rock so heavy that he couldn't lift. Why? Because it's not logically possible. And so when we come to the problem of evil, it is logically impossible for God to create free will creatures who always choose to do the right thing. It's a logical impossibility. So when we tackle this idea or this problem of evil, we have to come to terms with what is true and what is false, and we have to give the proper background and under, uh, understanding to these definitions and these terms. You know, when I think about the problem of evil, and I think about the pointlessness of it at times, and I think about the idea of why I have such a big problem, C.S. Lewis, being one of my favorite philosophers and apologists about this issue, wrote this. My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. As an atheist, this was his argument. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? In other words, this problem of evil is staring me at the face and I'm crying out to God and I'm asking this question, why would God permit evil? But how had I got the idea of evil in the first place? In other words, you can't call a line crooked if you don't know what a straight line is. And we can't call something evil if we don't know what good is. We can't call something wrong if we don't know what right is. And so when we consider this problem of evil, we need to bring this kind of perspective to this issue. There are some things I'd like for us to consider before we tackle this problem of evil. And the first one is this. Our perspective on the problem of evil is limited. On evil itself is limited. We don't see everything that God sees. We are not in a position to say, God probably lacks good reasons to allow evil. In fact, this is the death blow to atheism and those who use the problem of evil to reject the existence of God. Because here's the burden of atheism. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that God lacks absolutely no good reason. God has no good reason to allow evil. Well, that's a really heavy burden to bear. In fact, philosophers do contend and argue that it's impossible. You can't prove it. There's no way to get the information to justify that claim. And so that's why philosophers have gone away from the problem of evil because it just doesn't hold up intellectually. But like I said, it still hurts us. We still feel this problem. I like how Job put it. Job said, can anyone teach knowledge to God since he judges those on high? And again, do you listen in on God's counsel or limit wisdom to yourself? You see, we are limited in time as people. We are limited in space. We are limited in intelligence and insight. And there is so much information that we simply do not have. But God isn't limited. You know, when I think about the problem of evil, I think about the fact that it could be certainly true 
that in order to achieve his purposes for the world, God had to permit evil. He had to allow that possibility to take place. And so this suffering that we see may seem pointless. This suffering that we see may see like, God, you really don't have an answer or a reason for it. But that doesn't mean God doesn't see the big picture. Just because our knowledge is limited doesn't mean God's knowledge is limited. And in fact, I actually know personally myself when I have went through physical pain, when I have suffered greatly, and a greater result has produced itself. You know, when I think about my wife and what she went through, bearing us children, you know, two beautiful children. They're the greatest blessings that I could ever ask for. They're rascals, but they are true gifts from God. And the amount of pain that she went through, and for those of you who are mothers, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Us men, we will never, ever experience that kind of pain. Women, they're tough. Okay, when you see your wife go through child's birth, you're like, wow, she's really strong. <laughs> I could not do it. But anyway, she went through so much pain, but yet this beautiful thing happened. And we had children, and it is such a great good that my wife would choose to go through that to have her children, and she would never take it back and never reverse it. And you know, sometimes there are things that we do in this life that are painful, but yet a greater good comes about. Here's the bottom line we are limited. God isn't. But then there's another part to this. God sees the big picture. We don't. We don't see the big picture. We don't see everything there is to see. In fact, if there was a picture as big as this auditorium, we can only see one little tiny bit of it. But yet God sees the entire thing. You know, um, I'd like to show you a picture of a man named Eddie Hall. And at first, looking at this gentleman, I know it's a smaller picture, you would consider somebody like this to be a very unhealthy individual, right? Uh, being overweight is terrible for your heart. In fact, obesity is one of the worst things that American culture deals with. It is, gives heart disease, it causes Alzheimer's. I mean, there are just so many things that happen as a result of obesity. But you were to look at somebody like this, you were to say, well, this is probably a relatively unhealthy individual until you step back and you get a little bit more background information to this, that actually Eddie Hall is an extremely strong person. He's not as unhealthy as what he might seem in that small picture. And he actually won the World's Strongest Man competition in 2017. The guy is a world-class athlete. You see, when you bring in background information to what seems like a problem, it's able to bring perspective. And that's the same thing that happens with the problem of evil. What is the background information to the problem of evil? Well, it's simply this, arguments for God's existence. There are, are over a dozen good arguments for God's existence, and we are not going to spend time going through all of those this morning because your brains would be fried. Look, my brain's fried after studying the problem of evil, and I've already thrown out some terms, and I'm sure some of you are like, man, I, I have no idea what's happening right now. But that's okay. This is for you to look up and study a little bit more on your own. But there are, there, are, there are arguments for the existence of God, like for instance, the cosmological argument that shows that we had a beginning to our universe. Well, time, space, and matter just doesn't pop into existence without a cause. That violates every scientific natural law that we know. Things have causes. And so what caused the universe to, to come into existence? Well, we contend that it was God, immaterial, timeless, spaceless incredibly powerful, a disembodied mind, in other words, caused the material universe to come into existence at once. And that's what we find in the book of Genesis. But then there's also the teleological argument that we have a certain design and an order to our universe. And there are a lot of other arguments like the moral argument or the ontological argument, which I fully don't understand still. But here's the point. When you've got a lot of really good reasons to believe in the existence of God, it paints a much better picture to the problem of evil. Maybe there's something that I'm lacking. Maybe I don't have all the information because there's a lot of good reasons to believe in God, but I've got a problem with, e with evil that I need to figure out. And so the key phrase that I would focus in on is simply this. When we discover that God exists and Christianity is true, we have a more complete picture to provide a perspective to understanding why God permits evil. But let's just ask the question. Are there any good reasons why God would permit evil that you can think of? You know, I think about Isaiah chapter 55, where God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts higher, higher than your thoughts. That there may be good reason why God provides and allows evil. There's a few that I actually thought about. First of all, free will. 
I'm glad that I get to choose. I'm glad that I am not forced into making a decision and to having a relationship with God. You know, we practice what's called believer's baptism here. That we believe once a child reaches the age of accountability, they should make the decision to follow Jesus for themselves. They should be taught. They should be guided. They should be instructed. But they should never be forced or obligated. You're going to make this decision because I made this decision. You know, I want my children to love me for who I am. I don't want them to force, to be forced to love dad. I want them to make that free will choice. And so this is a good reason why God might permit evil is because we have free will. Joshua 24 puts it like this. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, he's speaking to the people of Israel. Choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It is our choice, and that is good. Another reason why I think God might permit evil and suffering is that we actually seek fellowship with God through suffering. There are so many people all over the world who suffer, and unlike many Americans, their suffering draws them near to God. They actually come to the Lord and seek to understand what they're going through. And unfortunately, as I said last week, we are raised in a society that is focused on naturalism, that the physical material universe is all there ever was, all there ever is, and all there ever shall be. And so we live in a culture devoid of purpose, but suffering can provide purpose to our life. It can bring perspective. Psalm 119, verse 71 says this, and imagine writing this. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statues. It is good that I went through that, God, because I learned more about you. That may be a good reason why God permits suffering. Another one is character formation. There have been times in my life, and you could probably think about some moments in yours, where you went through a mess. You went through hell on earth, but you came out on the other side a better person than what you went into it with. And that's what the Bible teaches. Suffering produces greater Christian character. James put it like this, Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. That like iron, sharpening iron, there are bound to be sparks that are going to fly. It hurts going through that process. But at the end of the day, that suffering has produced a character in you which you would not have had if it were not for that trial. And then finally, I think something about eternity when it comes to the problem of evil. That imagine going through this life, dealing with all that we deal with, and how that will make us eternally grateful to have our new body and a new heavens and a new earth where we get to enjoy the presence of God and our family and our loved ones and we get to explore and study and learn and we get to work without hating and eat without getting diseases and being obese and we get to go out into the world and explore the Amazon without getting infectious diseases that are gonna kill us. I mean, just a world that will be inter eternally enjoyed because we experience suffering here. And that's what Paul had to say in Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. And so when we look at the problem of evil, we have to understand what we've already talked about. God loves you and he wants you to freely choose to love him. And he's not gonna force you to do that. But number two, it was not logically possible for God to create a world in which every free-willed creature chose God and always to do the right thing. It wasn't logically possible for God to create a world like that. And that there actually could be good reasons why God may permit evil, but we aren't able to fully understand and recognize that yet. So where are we at as a Christian in understanding this problem of evil? Well, there are four key teachings in the Bible that I think help bring perspective to the problem of evil that no other religion offers. And I do believe Christianity to be true. I think it is the only way and the only path to reach the person that we call God. And I think the Bible brings the best perspective on this problem of evil. And the first one we've already kind of touched on, number one is simply this. God's purpose is not restricted to this life, but it spills out beyond a greater life in eternity. And this is what the Bible teaches. There is more. That's what we've talked about over the last couple of weeks. There is so much more 
to be enjoyed and to be lived. There is eternity that we will get to experience. And when you bring that perspective to your current suffering and problem, I hope it encourages you to press on for what more is. I hope that hope gives you the strength to walk through whatever mess it is that you're going through knowing there is more. Paul put it like this in 2 Corinthians 4.16, Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond our comprehension. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. There is more. And for those of us who are in Christ, that's where we're headed. But there's another doctrine, and this is something that is really a culture shock to us. And here's what, it, here's what it is. Do you know the chief purpose for our life is not our own happiness, but our holiness? That God is more concerned about you being in a relationship with him than he is about you being happy with the things that you have and the place that you are. And to us, we're like, well, that seems kind of weird. I mean, I thought becoming a Christian, it's supposed to make me happy and healthy and holy and everything's gonna be great. And that's simply not the case, especially for those of you who know um, what it's like to be a Christian for any amount of time, you know that this life will bring you pain and suffering. But God is not primarily concerned about your happiness. That doesn't mean he throws your happiness out the window. Of course he wants you to be happy. But most importantly, he wants to know you and he wants you to make him known. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10, for instance, says this, God disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. God isn't concerned with punishing you. That's not who he is. He's concerned with disciplining you like a good parent because he wants you to share in his holiness because God sees the big picture. And he knows that your suffering is limited to a small piece to the puzzle. And when you get to share in his holiness, it will bring you much greater joy and much greater happiness. If we were to ask the Apostle Paul, Paul, why does God let you suffer the way that you do? I mean, Paul went through a mess. He had everything, religious status. He was a leader of, a, of the Pharisees. He had money. He got to go on mission trips all the time. I mean, the guy had everything you could ever have. He was like, uh, you know, 30 under 30 millennial. I mean, this guy was the most impressive young man ever. And then when he became a Christian, his life was ruined. <laughs> in our perspective. I mean, he was beaten. He was stoned to death and he actually died and they were able to resuscitate him and bring him back to life. Can you imagine standing against a cave wall and having stones thrown at you until you died? That would not, you'd be like, man, I don't know if this Christian thing is worth it. And a lot of early Christians went through stuff like this and they asked the same question. I mean, this guy was shipwrecked and he was stripped of his clothes naked. He had no clothes and he was freezing. I mean, horrible stuff that this guy went through. And so if we were to ask the Apostle Paul, Paul, why does God let you suffer the way that you do? Here's what Paul would say and answer that question. He would say in Philippians chapter four, I suffer that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. In other words, I suffer because Jesus suffered. I go through this that I may know God. I go through this because I am looking at something far much greater, far much more, knowing God and one day spending eternity with him. That's how Paul would answer that question. And so suffering really can bring about a deeper understanding of God, a more intimate knowledge of God, a deeper relationship with him. And this is the entire point of human history, that we may know God. That's why he put us here. C.S. Lewis put it like this, we can ignore pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God says, I am here. I am here. Seek me, find me, know me. Another doctrine that we need to understand, another teaching is this. We are in a state of rebellion against God and his purpose. When we look at the problem of evil, guess who the problem is? Us. That's on the moral side. Of course, we deal with natural evil. Hurricanes, like what's getting ready to hit Florida, or volcano eruptions. And there are things that happen to this world that 
um, cause life to be wonderfully beautiful. I mean, without tectonic plates, for instance, there are so many things in this life that we wouldn't be able to enjoy and have on the natural side, the natural world. But at the same time, it comes at a cost. Natural evil. But we also have moral evil. And the Bible teaches this. In Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God has given us the freedom to choose. And the main issue for the problem of evil is us. Some evil man, not some mentally deranged person, some evil person shot people up in Texas. These people are evil. And yes, mental health is real. I've already said that a dozen times over the last couple weeks. But evil is real too. And we cannot disregard it. But it can still bring purpose to our life. But here's the most important part. And this is what we're going to end with. Okay? The greatest perspective on the problem of evil is simply this. Look to the cross. Look to the cross. See, Jesus isn't Buddha. He doesn't sit in a corner like a wooden statue. He's not nirvana. He's not some immaterial force that's to be experienced once you're able to reach a certain enlightenment in your mind. He is not Allah. He is not cursing you from heaven, looking at you, going through suffering, and saying, you disobedient infidel, I'm going to curse you with suffering. Oh no. The only Christian doctrine the exclusive doctrine of Christianity is that God is not far beyond our suffering. God is Emmanuel with our suffering. He is present. He is here. And he demonstrated his presence through our suffering on the cross. He suffered and he died to provide us with an eternal, life-giving connection with God. And it is the cross that offers us hope. It is the cross that promises us in time, I will make all things new. I will right all the wrongs. I will bring perspective to the pain that you're going through. And I promise because of the cross. And so let's end with Isaiah chapter 53. If you want to turn there and read one of the most beautiful, eloquent passages of scripture in all of the Bible. It's like highlight the whole thing. Israel was going through a very terrible moment in their history, and it was because of their own poor decision-making. They worshiped other idols. Everybody who was supposed to be a religious leader took advantage of the people, took advantage of the poor. They were sexually immoral. I mean, the nation of Israel was a complete mess. And so um, in 722 uh, BC, a guy, the king of Assyria, came, and he destroyed the nation of Israel, and he took the 10 tribes of Israel, the northern 10 tribes, captive to never be seen again, and only Judah and Benjamin were left. And so Israel was being put through a horrific history. And then along comes Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, destroys Israel, tears down their walls. Why? Because they were, they were sinful. They were evil. And then here come the Persians. I mean, time and time again throughout history, God rebuked the nation of Israel because of their sin and their evil choices. But God promised them something very important. Look to the future. Look to the cross, even though they didn't know what that cross would be. And he gives them a little glimpse of what this future would be in Isaiah chapter 53. And this passage is called the suffering servant. And here's what it says. Who has believed our report, our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, this servant that will come, shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. In other words, this dead plant is going to spring to life and it's going to show a promise. And here's the promise. Describes him a little bit more. He says he has no form of comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus may not have been an attractive man. That's kind of what Isaiah is alluding to. You would not look to him and say supermodel status. Just a normal guy, hardworking carpenter. You would never pick him out of a crowd to be anybody special, but there's something special about him. As he matures, as he grows, he is no ordinary man. He goes on to say, something's going to happen to him. He's going to suffer. He's despised and he's rejected by men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. As we hid, as it were, our faces from him, he was despised and we did not esteem him. In other words, even people who witness this person and what he's going through are going to turn away from him. And in the course of his life, in the course of his work, he's going to meet the most strong opposition possible. 
It's going to even make him less desirable. Gosh, this is an ordinary guy. What did he do to incur this kind of wrath? A promise is coming. And it says in verse 4, and this is what's helped me in my suffering and my problem of evil as I've experienced life over the course of, of my history. Here's, here's what verse 4 says. Surely he is born whose griefs? Ours. And carried whose sorrows? Ours. Yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But this guy that's coming, this promise that's coming, he's going to be under, able to understand what we go through. He's going to be smitten with our sorrows, with our griefs, with what we go through. He's not some distant God up in the clouds. He is God with us. He's going to know what it is that we go through and somehow supernaturally on the cross, Jesus is able to experience and know and understand what each individual person and the course of this history and the course of this life has went through. And it says in verse five, he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities, that he was punished in our place. He didn't just bear the burden of the cross. He took our punishment. He bore the punishment of our sins. He carried our griefs and our sorrows on the cross. And it says the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. And we like sheep have gone astray. And we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That man, we are sheep who just go astray and wander off and do our own thing. But God gave us a promise. I am going to send somebody who's going to die for you and suffer with you and go through life with you. I promise because of the cross. It says in verse seven, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as sheep before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. And they even made his grave with the wicked. But with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. And that's exactly what we find in the Gospels. He was buried like a common criminal, but a guy named Joseph came along and took care of his body and put him in a rich man's tomb, anointed him with oil that he would resurrect from. You see, he was condemned to death like a criminal, but his burial had a mixture of honor and dishonor. And then finally this, yet it pleased the Lord to crush him. It pleased the Lord to allow him to go through what he went through. Not because God is some sadistic person, like a parent enjoying the punishment of their child. But God was pleased. Why? Well, here's why. He has put him to grief. And when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and he shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. There is an eternal perspective to his suffering. And here's the point that comes to us. He shall see the labor of his soul, and he shall be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. The ultimate answer to the problem of evil is the cross. Because God saw the eternal perspective that he could justify you, that he could declare you not guilty for the evil that is done to you, for the evil that you have done yourselves through the cross. Perspective on evil is the ultimate answer. And so my encouragement you, to you is this. As you go through the valley of the shadow of death, look to the cross because it's God's promise. I am with you and there is more.